I would even go by the way that the man from whom I'm named had his habitat. And I would watch Martin Luther as he tacks his 95 theses on the door at the church of Wittenberg. But I wouldn't stop there. But I wouldn't stop there. I would come on, I would come on up even to 1863 and watch a vacillating president by the name of Abraham Lincoln finally come to the conclusion that he had to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. But I wouldn't stop there. I would even come to the early 30s and see a man grappling with the problems of the bankruptcy of his nation and come with an eloquent cry that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. But I wouldn't stop there. Strangely enough, I would turn to the Almighty and say, if you allow me to live just a few years in the second half of the 20th century, I will be happy. Now that's a strange statement to make because the world is all messed up. The nation is sick, trouble is in the land, confusion all around. That's a strange statement, but I know somehow that only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. And I see God working in this period of the 20th century in a way that men in some strange way are responding. Something is happening in our world. The masses of people are rising up and wherever they are assembled today, whether they are in Johannesburg, South Africa, Nairobi, Kenya, Accra, Ghana, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Jackson, Mississippi, or Memphis, Tennessee, the cry is always the same. We want to be free. And another reason I'm happy to live in this period is that we have been forced to a point where we're going to have to grapple with the problems that men have been trying to grapple with through history. But the demands then forced them to do it. Several demands that we grappled with them, men for years now have been talking about war and peace. But now, no longer can they just talk about it. It is no longer a choice between violence and non-violence in this world. It's violence or non-existence. That is where we are today. Let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination. Let us move on in these powerful days, these days of challenge, to make America what it ought to be. We have an opportunity to make America a better nation. And I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. And while sitting there autographing books, a demented black woman came up. The only question I heard from her was, are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down writing, and I said, yes. The next moment, I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented woman. I was rushed to Harlem Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon, and that blade had gone through, and the x-rays revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my oil, the main artery. And once that is punctured, you're drowned in your own blood. That's the end of it. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had merely sneezed, I would have died. Well, about four days later, they allowed me, after the operation, after my chest had been opened and the blade had been taken out, to move around in the wheelchair of the hospital. They allowed me to read some of the mail that came in. And from all over the states and the world, kind letters came in. I read a few, but one of them I will never forget. I have received one from the president and the vice president. I've forgotten what those telegrams said. I received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York, but I've forgotten what that letter said. But there was another letter that came from a little girl a young girl who was a student at the White Plains High School. And I looked at that letter, and I'll never forget it. It says simply, Dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student at the White Plains High School. She said, while it should not matter, I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. 
I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering, and I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. And I'm simply writing you to say that I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. And I want to say tonight, I want to say tonight that I too am happy that I didn't sneeze. Because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1960 when students all over the South start sitting in at lunch counters. And I knew that they were sitting in. They were really standing up for the best in the American dream and taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy, which were dug deep by the founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. If I had sneezed, I would have been around in 1961 when we decided to take a ride for freedom and ended segregation in interstate travel. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around in 1962 when Negroes in Albany, Georgia decided to straighten their backs up. And whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. If I had sneezed, if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been here in 1963 when the black people of Birmingham, Alabama aroused the conscience of this nation and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later that year in August to try to tell America by the dream that I had. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been down in Selma, Alabama to see the great movement there. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who were suffering. Yes, I'm happy that I didn't sneeze. 